Across America, suburban sprawl threatens what were once pristine natural landscapes and endangers ways of life that have existed for generations. Faced with the challenges of development and an exploding population, many small towns and counties are having to make hard choices about the future of their communities. In places like Pike County, Pennsylvania, the decisions made today will affect the county's quality of life for generations to come. Pike County is a haven of natural beauty and rural living, tucked in Pennsylvania's northeast corner at the edge of the greater New York megalopolis. Home to large tracts of unspoiled woodlands, an extensive network of waterfalls, and abundant wildlife, the county has been a rural retreat for urban refugees since the mid-19th century. It's a place where lakes and rivers dot the landscape, where boaters can motor, paddle, or sail in and around some of the most beautiful scenery in the Northeast. This is the place where visitors from nearby metropolitan areas escape to a simpler, quieter world, where the rhythms of nature replace the jarring noise and hectic pace of city living. In Pike County, a grandfather can still spend a summer afternoon teaching his granddaughter the art of fishing, and a father can connect with his sons in their own sanctuary, far away from urban pressures. In Milford, the county seat, the streets are lined with specialty shops catering to those seeking unique art, antiques, or any number of other works that can't be found on the shelves of a big box store. But this way of life is under growing pressure from the ever-sprawling East Coast Urban Corridor. Though you would never guess it while hiking and biking through the tens of thousands of acres of park and game lands, or rafting down the free-flowing Delaware River, Pike County, Pennsylvania is just 75 miles from the heart of Manhattan. New residents attracted by the area's natural beauty and relatively inexpensive land prices have made Pike County the fastest growing county in Pennsylvania and one of the fastest growing counties in the country. People have come to Pike County seeking a sort of utopia and I think that the natural setting here that is so extraordinary and unique in the New York region lends itself to that. One of the things that makes the county special today was largely forgotten for about 50 years that from World War II to about 10 or 15 years ago, for a variety of reasons, the interstate highway system went in other places. There wasn't great transportation to get here. That even though it's so close to New York, it was kind of like overlooked and bypassed by the, the development patterns. That growth has kind of encircled it, and suddenly there's this vacuum in the middle and there's this, this rush to fill that in. While almost a third of Pike County's natural landscape is permanently protected state or federal ownership, large tracts of land in private hands are under tremendous pressure from developers anxious to meet the demand for housing. It's green everywhere you look. The problem is it isn't going to be forever green. It's just a matter of time before the population pressures cause those open spaces to go. With this booming population comes the need for new schools and expensive infrastructure improvements. Wilderness becomes suburbia. The rural character is changed forever. And the creatures of the forest are forced to adapt or die. I mean, when we got here in 1984, a lot of the area along the Delaware was undeveloped. And now it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really developed. I used to go hawking next to the high school for rabbits and, and squirrels. That whole area from the high school all the way up almost to, uh, to Port Jervis is, is now all developed with malls and box stores and, and other things. So that habitat is gone. It's never easy. You know, there's the idea of sustainable development and those are two words that are very easy to put together in one phrase and they're quite hard to put together in practice on the ground. So there's nothing easy about merging those two ideas of conservation, but I think that is what's going on in a place like this. We have the National Park, it's a wonderful preserve, it's there, it's, it's not going to be managed intensively for anything other than recreation. And we have parts of the landscape which are going to go into shopping malls. And how do we get those things to be part of the same landscape? New York City is like the, the huge gorilla with its you know, foot up in the air ready to stomp down on us any moment. <laughs> and we're carefully sort of constructing our defenses so we can withstand that uh, and survive it. An important part of these defenses are the many people in Pike County who are passionate about the environment. People who in their own way are actively involved in protecting what is most special to them about their county. Motivated by a love of nature and a concern for their area, these are the kind of people found in every community across the country. The kind of people who give of their time and talents to make a difference where they can. Their contributions to Pike County and the motivations behind them are as diverse as these individuals themselves. 
Some are passionate about a particular forest, body of water, or a specific view. Some others are dedicated to teaching the next generation how to be good stewards, while others work to foster understanding between opposing groups and conflicting values. But no matter how they choose to get involved, each of these individuals shares a devotion to preserving the environment and the character of the community they love. They and others like them are the nature's keepers of Pike County. Peter Pinchot comes from a long line of conservationists. In fact, his grandfather, Gifford Pinchot, is considered the father of the conservation movement in America. To Peter, the challenges facing Pike County are clear and immediate. We know that the population is going to double or triple in the next 10, 15, 20 years. That's inevitable. There's nothing we can do about that. It's not driven by anything that happens internally. That's big demographic forces. It's big capital moving to this area that, that comes with developers that can can uh, buy up pieces of land and, and turn them into much more valuable housing developments. We can't stop that. Maybe we don't even want to stop it, but we can control it. One of Peter's favorite projects is the Milford Experimental Forest. The forest is an important part of the nation's conservation history, having served as the summer home of the Yale School of Forestry in the early years of the 20th century. Under Peter's guidance, it is being managed to avoid past forest mismanagement problems, while implementing improved forest management strategies for the future. What we're trying to do is to recreate a new kind of experimental forest which is relevant to the private landowners in the Delaware Highlands region, the general region, the tri-state region around here, where we need to do a tremendous amount of forest restoration work and figure out how to make the forest uh, bring about an economic payout for the landowners so that they have a, a real reason to protect the land. This ability to find and promote the economic benefits of conservation initiatives is at the heart of what many in Pike County are trying to accomplish. In order for this approach to be effective, both conservation and development advocates must come together to find common ground where possible. And thereby maintain a rural uh, working landscape where people still can make their money in part by uh, managing that land, whether it's for forestry or wildlife or whether it's for summer camps or whether it's for bed and breakfast inns, many different ways of, of making ecotourism, because all those things are part of the working landscape of this region, and it requires a lot of people caring a lot, coming in from different viewpoints, uh, who don't necessarily agree with each other at the start, but they sort of loosely understand that it's, they can't develop an area with a bunch of environmentalists who are going to try to stop them unless they bring those into, people into the, the center of the, of the discussion, and you can't protect the landscape and exclude the developers and think that you're going to end up with uh, an intact landscape. And that's the kind of dialogue which has been happening in this region for the last 10 years and I think is beginning to mature into a sense where we really can do long-range planning. You have to come together into the center and start talking to each other. With abundant forests, rivers, and lakes, Pike County is the ideal home for many species of birds of prey. But as development encroaches on their habitat, these majestic hunters of the sky are coming into greater contact with people, and that's leading to conflicts they aren't equipped to deal with. Fortunately for the raptors of Pike County and the surrounding areas, they have some very devoted friends at the Delaware Valley Raptor Center. The center, run by Bill and Stephanie Streeter, includes a full medical clinic as well as numerous enclosures designed to enable each injured bird to heal as fully as possible. When visiting the center, it's obvious that this is a working rehabilitation clinic and not a simple aviary. The most important considerations are the birds and their care. They're built for rehab birds. They're not necessarily built for display. We're not a zoo. They're built for birds to recover most efficiently and safely. The more complicated the make, you make the inside of a structure, the more likely the animal is to to hurt itself in one way or another, get, they get caught up on something. And uh, birds do well here, they always have. Most of the birds at the center are there because of unfortunate interactions with humans. It's a problem that's likely to become even greater in the years ahead. Number one reason is they're hit by cars. People are most likely to find them that way. Uh, prob that's probably one of the reasons why it's the number one reason. Uh, people we'll see them roadside. If a bird's injured out in the woods, it's a lot less likely to be found. While getting a look at the rehabilitating and resident raptors isn't easy at the center's two locations, Bill and Stephanie often take birds out into the community in an effort to entertain and educate the public about raptors. 
These outreach programs enable people to interact with the birds in a way they wouldn't normally be able to. It's an education thing that, that people understand and appreciate them, but we want to do it in a way that we don't beat them over the head about it, entertain them and educate them at the same time uh, so they have appreciation for birds of prey, their place in the natural environment. If you see raptors up close, you're most likely to notice them, where in the past you would overlook them if you're driving down the road. Ultimately, the streeters' hard work and devotion is rewarded when they're able to release a raptor back into the wild. Not every bird they work with is so lucky, however, which makes the successes all the more special for Bill, Stephanie, and the staff of the Raptor Center. The bird has either been electrocuted um, by lightning or by power lines, and it came in with most of its uh, flight feathers on one side completely melted doesn't have a whole lot of experience and uh, she is being released during migration season where not only does she have to gain experience to be a proficient fish catcher she's got to fly maybe as far as South America depending on how far south that she decides to fly but you can't just keep them forever you have to give them their shot Everything that can be done to optimize her release and her success once she's in the wild has been done for her. Hopefully, she'll make it. Ha ha! Oh, that is just lovely. Look at her go. Look at the altitude. Ruth Jones has been paddling the waters of the upper Delaware River her entire life. In the 1940s, her parents opened one of the first canoe trip operators in the area. For Ruth, it was the beginning of a relationship with the river that has lasted a lifetime. I was an only child, and there were no neighbors for like four miles. So I, I played on the river. Uh, it, it was my playground, my playmate, and like a best friend. And to this day, it still is. I still consider it my best friend. Since taking over the family business, Ruth has seen many changes in the industry. Where canoes and rafts were once the most common way to travel down the Delaware, visitors today are discovering new ways to experience the river. And now the trend is kayaking. Everyone wants to kayak. I think it's a great thing for families because teenagers have a tendency not to want to do things on a family outing anymore. But the parents are in a canoe and they put the teenagers each in their own kayak. They're paddling independently, which is what they want to do, but they're still on a family outing, and it, it's a healthy experience for a family. With a lifetime of experience on this part of the Delaware, Ruth has an enormous amount of knowledge to share with her customers, many of whom are newcomers to the area and to the river. When you paddle down the river, you shouldn't paddle down the middle of the river. Paddle along a shoreline and just be very observant. There's wildflowers, there's all kinds of bird life and wildlife and plant life. It's like a whole new world out there just waiting to be discovered. I have a saying, a waterway, when properly used, is the only trail through nature that man can travel without leaving a trace of his passing. Think about that. You put your paddle in the water and you pull it out, you can't tell that paddle was in the water. You don't leave footprints, you don't make erosion. Unfortunately, not everyone heeds Ruth's advice. Some visitors leave behind proof of their passage on the river in the form of trash. Fortunately for the river and those who enjoy its pristine beauty, Ruth continues to be a faithful friend and custodian. My son and I both noticed back in the late 80s that the river was really getting trashed. A lot of beer cans, a lot of garbage, and we decided something should be done about it. So we organized a river cleanup in 1990. But the best part is now the same volunteers come back year after year after year. It's like a big family reunion every year and they're all friends. And they all work very hard and they're all very diligent and dedicated to cleaning up the river and they, they do an awesome job. We have retrieved over 7,000 tires over this period and close to 300 tons of trash in total weight. Just imagine if that were all in this river. Would you want to paddle on it? I don't think so. And if you keep a river clean and you're consistent in keeping it clean, people that paddle down the river will have a tendency not to throw more trash in the river. So you have to maintain it. You have to do it on an annual basis. You can't skip a year. It just makes me feel good. But from a business standpoint,
the river is a resource that Kittatinny Canoes uses for their income, for their livelihood. But you cannot keep taking from a resource without putting something back. And th this is our way of putting back. Robin Wildermuth is a professional forester who lives and works in Pike County. While the tens of thousands of acres of forest land in Pike County may look healthy and lush to most people, to Robin's trained eye, all is not well. Generations of logging, failed attempts at farming, and long bouts of brush fires have taken their toll. This actually looks like it might provide some cover for animals, but right now it's providing no deer food and very little food for any other species. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get back to that early 1900s habitat where there's thickets that provide a lot of uh, food and cover, uh, especially for ground nesting birds and deer, etc. So we're trying to regenerate these forests and bring back a, a diverse species mix. Many of Robin's clients are hunting and fishing clubs, some of which trace their origins back a century or more. The clubs are privately owned plots of land that enable their members to gather socially as well as hunt, fish, and share the joy of the outdoors. The clubs have a vested interest in keeping their lands wild and viable for hunting and fishing, but rising land prices have created pressure on these private clubs to sell their wild acres for development. I think most of the hunt clubs have, have definitely uh, been good stewards. They've protected the land uh, over the years and uh, really have been a, a wonderful part of the landscape. If it wasn't for the hunt and fishing clubs, I mean right now you probably wouldn't see this like you see it now. This would be nothing but houses around here. Once in a while somebody will inquire. I think over the years we've had builders in the club that maybe thought that it would go somewhere besides being a club and maybe a, a development. They'd have their foot in the door, things like that. I, I mean, uh, today in this area, they're always looking for a piece of property. In the meantime, Robin continues to work with landowners to regenerate their forests. Sometimes that means taking extreme measures to protect acreage by fencing it in, to keep it safe from the animals that need it most. It's a bittersweet proposition for Robin. So this forest is sort of healing from the damage done by the deer, but it's happening uh, fairly slowly. It's probably going to take another three or four years um, before this is really striking to just an ordinary passerby, but I'm starting to see a lot of things in there. But the longer we leave it up, the more species will be reintroduced, uh, the more diversity we'll get, and the thicker we'll create the cover. But, I mean, it's a shame that you have to protect what is the best habitat for deer. You have to protect it from the deer. deer. That's the only way to, to create it. As a forester, Robin deals in timescales longer than most people. He knows that decades of damage to the landscape will not be undone overnight, and that land which is in the process of rehabilitating may never have the chance to heal entirely. I think the, the next decade or so will uh, determine the fate of most of the properties. Yeah, unless we can manage viable wildlife populations and sustain the hunting, the interests of the hunting population, or if we can't, maintain the character of the area that attracts the resort trade, we're just going to lose those components of the landscape. The conservation efforts of today's Pike County are not the first attempts to protect its natural heritage, but rather are part of a legacy that reaches to the very beginnings of America's conservation movement. Overlooking the town of Milford is Gray Tower's National Historic Site, a working monument to those early days and a source of inspiration to conservation advocates. When James Pinchot built Gray Towers, much of the landscape in Pike County had been denuded by loggers, including his own father. James's friends included some of the leading artists of the day, among them the Hudson River School painters, who documented the beauty and ultimate destruction of the Northeast landscapes. It was against this family and personal background that in 1885, James asked his son Gifford if he would consider becoming a forester. It was a radical thing to suggest to a young man. At the time, there were no professionally trained American foresters in America, nor was it even viewed as a profession. But it was a path that the younger Pinchot came to embrace, and that would change the face of the nation. After graduating from Yale and attending the École Nationale Forestière in Nancy, France, Gifford Pinchot eventually went on to become the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service in 1905. During his tenure, Pinchot increased the nation's forest reserves from 56 million acres to 172 million acres. 
It is for these advancements and progressive thinking that Gifford is remembered by today's foresters and conservation advocates. His real contributions were probably more as a forester politician than as a forester. His real brilliance was in making things happen on a big scale, um, not necessarily in the science of, of trees. And basically introduced that first conservation movement, along with Theodore Roosevelt, as, um, as having three tiers. And many of us think this is still a pretty relevant concept today, that, that a good conservation policy was based on preserving the resource and taking care of the resource itself, was based on economics, and was based on distribution of wealth and with concerns for things like poverty and the greater good. I think one of Gifford's big contributions is that those three things had to be balanced. He was so far ahead of his time, we we're in some ways still catching up. Gray Towers is a tangible connection to the very beginning of America's conservation movement. Today, after an historic restoration, the property is open to the public for tours, conservation education, and inspiration. The main value of Gray Towers to the agency today is as a, um, an incubation place, as a think tank center for um, leadership development groups. We have people come to Gray Towers with a real range of, of backgrounds. Some people come here thinking that this, this is uh, hallowed ground and really appreciating it from the moment they walk in, they've heard of it. Other people come and haven't even heard of Gifford Pinchot. We hope that it's more than just a, a neat old house. And what we try to do is introduce people to some of those basic concepts Gifford believed in that are still pretty relevant today and have people appreciate that conservation has been uh, going on a long time and it's had its ups and it's had its downs and there's still plenty of work to do. The contentious collision of industry and environment that took place here in the past. Many of today's business leaders have both personal and professional motivations for seeking the right balance. They work together with public officials, conservation experts, and concerned citizens to ensure that as the county grows, it does so in ways that respect the values of the community while creating sustainable development. As residents work to find the right balance between development and conservation on the community level, one family seeks to strike that balance in a more personal way. The Kiesendahl family has lived in Pike County and owned and operated Woodlock Resort since the 1950s. Originally consisting of a lodge and a few cabins on 12 acres, it has grown to become a major resort as well as a second home community. For the Kiesendahls, the ability to find the proper balance between development and conservation has personal as well as business implications. Uh, this is our home, and once we develop it, we have to live with it. Uh, these are our neighbors, these are our friends, and uh, it has our name on it. But I think that makes me more passionate about maintaining and retaining what we have for, for my children. So when we started to uh, think about development and, and do something for other than hospitality, uh, we kept that the, the need for and the importance of the natural beauty at the forefront. And every time we have to make those decisions, we really sit around as a family and we decide what impact will this have on traffic, what impact will it have on how many trees we have to take down. And Bob put it right, this is our home. It's not just the development we're moving on from. Beyond just their personal desire to live in a rural environment, the Kiesendahls maintain its good business to balance conservation with growth, not just for their own, but for the community as a whole. This is an important part of the economic base for our area, and if we don't maintain it, there's nothing else here. There's no industry. There's, I mean, the industry is tourism. Uh, and people that want to come up and live in this natural beauty. So give people the opportunity to recharge, to revitalize, uh, they reconnect with their families. And in order to create that vi environment, you really need the nature. It's therapy. It's, it's, it's <laughs> therapeutic. Really... And, and you can't do it uh, if you have everything blacktop and cement and buildings everywhere. You... Sam Shahar is one of a growing number of real estate developers who have recently discovered the opportunities in Pike County. He's been working with local conservation and planning leaders on a proposed development along the shores of Lake Wallenpawpack. I think it is a way to combine the development with, uh, with preserving uh, big pieces of land. In Jersey and in New York, they took every piece of land, they destroyed the trees, they, they cut everything down and they... Uh, they took it, they make it small squares, and in each square they build a house. What I love in this part of the county is you can buy a 300 acres 
Uh, what I will try to do is to develop 10% or 15, can leave all the rest green. And this is what the city like, and the county, and I think it's a good thing for the future. For a developer like Sam to come to Pike County and create a successful and balanced venture takes time and effort. But ultimately, all parties will realize benefits from applying conservation principles when planning for the growth of the community. When I came here four years ago, I was a new kid on the block. I didn't know anything. What are the rules, regulation? Uh, people who they are local people, and they care about the lake and they care about the environment. And people who they are running this area, they are running the county, and uh, they know the rules and regulation. And I come with my own ideas, my own way of doing things. And they were very surprised in the beginning because everybody was trying to take a piece of land and take the maximum of that. So when I came here, they were very suspicious in the beginning. They didn't know how to take me. They didn't believe. It took me four years. So they understand I'm real and I really mean what I'm saying. And now to do a deal or to go to a new development is easy. As Pike County struggles with balancing economic development and conservation, Lake Wallenpawpack, which defines the county's northwest border, is a constant reminder that achieving that balance is an attainable goal. The lake, built in the 1920s by the damming of the Wallenpawpack stream, is an example of economic development in unison with creation of a new and thriving ecosystem. Maintaining the health of the lake's environment is essential to the economic well-being of the area. Well, it's been referred to as our industrial park. This, this lake is what drives the economy in, in much of Wayne and Pike County in, in Northeast Pennsylvania. And without it, and if the lake um, water quality ever deteriorates, you know, there would be a lot of businesses, not just ours, but you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of businesses that would be probably out of business. Uh, I like to distinguish between development and exploitation, where you're talking about land use changes. Uh, I, I define development as the creation of sustainable wealth, and this is a great example of it. it, it for the, the investment that went into it, it has created literally billions of dollars worth of, of real estate uh, and business. Eric Earhart's family has owned a resort on Lake Wallenpaw Pack since 1943. He credits Pennsylvania Power and Light, which owns the lake, with some of the success the lake community has had in maintaining a balance between environmental and development concerns. You're not allowed to cut any trees. You're not allowed to do really anything on the shoreline without their permission. And they're very careful about what they allow you to do. And when you look around the shoreline today, you don't really see a lot of houses because there are trees in front of them, even though houses are only 50 feet behind them, which has helped to preserve the natural beauty of the lake. Preserving that natural beauty has become more difficult over the years as the population in the area has increased and development around the lake has intensified. And Once the Eisenhower administration uh, put together the interstate highway system, of course, that put us in the backyard of the megalopolis with an easy access of 25 million people, all of whom wanted what we had always taken for granted. I think people that originally moved into the area maybe 30, 40 years ago, weren't as sensitive to the environment. But in the last 10 to 15 years, I think that's changed. The people that are moving here realize how valuable what we have is and how important it is to protect it. And by having those people that are moving in be part of the solution and not part of the problem has is, is been sig significant. And I think that's what's going to make it work. The quality of life and recreational opportunities are what continued to draw people to the lake and surrounding communities. It's what brought Eric back from a career in Washington to run the family business on the lake. I personally felt like a kind of like a rat in a maze. Everybody was going the same direction at the same time and uh, everybody wanted to be at the same place. Everybody worked the same hours and I like the freedom that I have here. People like that laid back atmosphere that's that's in this area. We're only a hundred miles from New York City, but yet it's a totally different world. They can escape uh, their hectic lives. And I've seen people, even when they come here, you see them when they first come and they're all stressed and tensed. And by the time they're here for a couple of days, they're unwound and relaxed and back to more of the natural people that they really are. Of all of Pike County's natural resources, perhaps none is more important than its water. 
From streams and rivers to ponds and lakes, water is a dominant part of the landscape and environment. Because clean water is readily available at the turn of a faucet, it's often taken for granted. As part of his job as a watershed specialist with the Pike County Conservation District, John Jose monitors the health of the county's water resources and educates people about the role they can play in keeping the county's water supply safe and clean. Central to this mission is communicating how people and water interact. That begins with looking at the region not as an expanse of towns, boroughs, and counties, but as a natural system of watersheds. Basically, it's like a, a large base formed by the shape of the land, and all the water that falls within that basin drains down through the basin into a body of water like a stream or a wetland or pond that receives all that water. Like most other features of the natural landscape here, the extensive watershed system is at risk from development. The water resources that are among the great attractions of the region may become victims of their own success. One of the reasons why we're so uh, the concern about the development here in Pike County is the impacts that development can have to our water resources, and that includes while the construction is actually taking place. Um, here you can see we've got um, bare soil that's been exposed, the, the vegetation's been removed, and now the concern is when it rains, we get what we call stormwater runoff, where's that dirt going to go? If it flows into a stream or a river, a uh, wetland or pond or lake, um, that can cause real problems for the aquatic life that lives there. In fact, soil, good old dirt, is one of our major pollution problems here in Pennsylvania. So here we have one way and this is something you see commonly in Pike County of controlling uh, soil runoff from sites. Um, this is called simply silt fence. And the idea is the silt fence acts as kind of a filter. If we have rain here and we have uh, some of this uh, bare dirt being picked off and moving across here with the stormwater runoff, it helps, hits the silt fence. The water can go through, but it acts like a filter to kind of catch the dirt so it doesn't run off the site. So you want to keep this dirt on your construction site here and keep it out of the streams and rivers and lakes. Streams as we see them today, these exceptional value and high quality streams um, may not be able to hold up in the face of this development if, if we're not developing our landscape with protection of these streams in mind. I don't think it's unforeseeable for us to lose these beautiful streams we have here and the aquatic life they support. The cooperative atmosphere and constructive community dialogue about growth and development issues in Pike County stands in stark contrast to several battles of the recent past. In the 1960s, a proposal to dam the Delaware River at Tox Island generated tremendous controversy and outrage, marking one of the first episodes of large-scale citizen activism over an environmental issue. Eventually, protests over the federal government's seizure of property and expected environmental damage from the proposed dam led to the abandonment of the project. In the mid-1980s, a proposed commercial development along Sawkill Creek at the edge of Milford polarized the community. It was an episode that has had long-lasting consequences for the area. There was a proposal to put a, a mall up at the intersection between um, Route 6 and 84, and this uh, location is, is very close to the Milford water supply springs, which supply the water for Milford and for surrounding uh, homeowners and the Water Authority was, was uh, worried that a mall up there might have some impact on their, their springs, and so they did a test, and it seemed to show that there was a very strong connection. If you put some dye close to the mall site uh, in, into the bottom of the stream, it would come out about 48 hours later, later into the, the public water supply. What ended up happening is it got upgraded to exceptional value, which is the highest designation of protection you can get in Pennsylvania. It was the first time when a stream that had commercial zoning in it was given this uh, designation and consequently it caused a real furor. John Duke Schneider is a local attorney and property owner. He was on the pro-development side of the Sawkill debate. At that time there became a, a pretty good uh, battle going on between what was called the Pike Environmental Defenders led by the Pinchot family and other environmentalists and a group of people that I was involved with called the Pike Partnership. The Pike Partnership was made up of some lawyers and realtors and people who had thoughts that by upgrading the stream it would in effect take away all rights of property owners to develop their property. You could put nothing into it. In other words, you were actually prohibited from discharging anything including uh, not only stream discharge but also things like parking lot discharge and things of that nature. As a consequence, 
the state upgraded it merely by that letter and then spent about two or three years doing studies to determine whether it actually should be upgraded. I think everybody that was part of that recognized that that, that fight was not the right way to make decisions and that we had to come and learn how to work with each other. And it took a while for everybody to cool down and, and realize that we all had similar goals. And it seems that most of the businesses, realtors and, uh, and, and people who are in that area, recognize that if, you, if it's done properly, you can get enhanced value because of the environmental protection. And uh, so you have to get through the battle to protect the private rights, the, the private property rights, but in the long run, if it's done properly, you do get a total enhanced value. The fruits of that dialogue can be seen in the passage of the $10 million Pike County Scenic Rural Character Preservation Bond Referendum with over 68% support. It would never have passed if a significant part of the development community was not for it. If they didn't realize that it was in their own economic self-interest to protect big parts of Pike County, uh, that this would drive up land values and drive up their values of their project. So it, was a, it, was a, it became much more collaborative. Again, not everybody's on the same page, but uh, much more so than it had been before. And the people who are the most potent conservationists are the people who live in those landscapes. And that's, that's the challenge, is to develop community systems which can capture the, the power of passion that people have for protecting their landscapes and turn it into real action that uh, finds that balance between development and protection of the landscape. While development that is sensitive to environmental concerns is an improvement over past practices, there are also areas that are so spectacular and important that many people want to see them preserved forever. Here in Pike County, individuals and groups have organized to take on that challenge. By engaging a wide variety of stakeholders, conservation-oriented organizations are attempting to foster dialogue and understanding while avoiding potentially disastrous confrontations. When it comes to land preservation, individuals often want to be helpful, but are unaware of what they can do. In Pike County, they can turn to Delaware Highlands Conservancy for help. The Conservancy is a community resource that works with individual property owners, real estate developers, and community organizations to help permanently protect important pieces of land. And the most wealth that you can achieve from a piece of land is by cutting it up, subdividing it, and selling it off into smaller parcels. And um, when you step in and say, wait a minute, some of that's all right, but some places are so special they should be left alone. We work with the Planning Commission quite regularly. Um, people are probably surprised at that, but a developer might come in and they might want to do a conservation subdivision. So they might have questions about how a land preservation agreement works or what are the benefits of doing it for them. They might want to understand what the terms of a land preservation agreement are. Um, and those are areas that we have expertise in land preservation agreements and in enforcing those agreements in, in perpetuity. If I want to see a natural area protected, one way that you can do that is to buy the land and own it. The other way to do it is to restrict the development on it with a conservation easement. And if the landowner is willing to do that voluntarily, it doesn't cost you very much at all. And if they're willing to do that for a fraction of the purchase price, then it costs you less to protect that landscape that you've deemed critical. These easements are binding contracts that restrict or prevent development on a property. In return, the landowner retains ownership of the land and often is entitled to significant tax benefits. The property itself stays on the tax rolls. You can't preserve it all and you wouldn't want to. And that's not our goal. It starts with the landowners loving his land or her land. It really begins there. And if you, if you have a lot of land set aside that's an investment, you don't want to hear from us. But if you love your land, we can help you save it. That's about what it gets down to. One such landowner with a special piece of land is Jane Quick. Her family had happily lived a rural life in Pike County for generations, but over time, development encroached on their property. It fell to Jane to preserve the family legacy. Fortunately for her, the Conservancy was eager to help. Jane called us and, and we came over and looked and, and recognized the value of what she has here and agreed that if uh, she asked me if, if we could help her keep her land from being subdivided, that her mother had asked her to do that on her deathbed. And I know Jane 
Her mother didn't have to ask her. She just flat out didn't want to see this place subdivided. What I was especially drawn to were the wetlands that are, are just over the hill here. And the great blue heron rookery that's there and the osprey nest that's there and the, and the ducks and the wildlife and the, and the water quality. It, it, two lakes drain into it that are, uh, the one lake is fairly heavily used. And these wetlands absorb the nutrients and the, the pollutants and keep the water clean. Despite the success of their organization, both Barbara and Sue see the changes taking place in and around Pike County and know there's still much more to be done. There's a sense of urgency after 9-11 hit New York City. People poured into this area. A lot of these homes here are, are second homes, part-time homes. That's changing. More and more people are moving here on a permanent basis now, bringing their children, trying to get away from the big urban centers that are vulnerable to terrorist attacks like New York City was. I think we are lucky that in Pike County that we have all these different groups that are willing to work together, that are willing to at least sit down at the table and talk and listen to one another, regardless of what it is that needs to be addressed, whether it's a conservation issue or a development issue. But I think that there is a willingness and an acceptance that we're only going to be able to shape Pike County's future if we work together. Twin Lakes is a small community in eastern Pike County. It's an enclave of seasonal homes, with many of the residents spending summer weekends here to escape from New York and cities across eastern Pennsylvania. Like many residents, Tom Hoff's family has owned a cabin on the shores of the larger of the two lakes for over a century, and he thinks things are ideal the way they are. I always had the feeling, and I can remember this as a kid in college, uh, that I never want to see this road change. In the late 90s, the quiet life on the lakes was endangered when the heirs of one of the area's largest landowners investigated the possibility of turning a 200-acre plot into a 250-home development. They had made contact with the realtor. I don't know whether they had worked with a developer per se, but it was moving ahead uh, to be sold as a, a large developable track. It would have made a very big difference the little road that comes in between the lakes and so on would have been impacted considerably with traffic. That road literally goes through people's backyards and almost through their kitchens. It would have increased the activity level and sheer numbers in a very private little dirt road area. Having previously established the Twin Lakes Conservancy in the mid-1980s, residents were prepared to act. In a period of three weeks, 90% of Twin Lakes residents responded to the Conservancy's call for voluntary contributions, and they were able to purchase the land that was at risk of development. That kind of says somehow what has happened as an experience at Twin Lakes in a dedication to keeping it as a, as a lake that you can probably drink. So people, when they make an environmental decision, I think are making it not because the association is telling them, they, as a group of individuals, are saying to the Conservancy, we, we endorse this, we think this is a good thing, and we're willing to put a couple of bucks or some kind of energy behind, behind doing it. After securing the property, the Conservancy turned it into a preserve for contributors to enjoy. There are a couple of spots I think people find is, is sort of favorite. Uh, the big, we call it kind of fern gully down, down the bottom of the hill where it's wet. Uh, is a pretty spot, but I think it's uh, solitude, it's quiet. It's the feeling that this is, belongs to us. It's ours and, and we're stewards of it. For Tom, the Twin Lakes Conservancy and the Preserve are a way to ensure that this place, which has meant so much to his family for so long, will always be here for future generations. I uh, had a, a tremendous career, but when I look back, having been, you know, at a fairly high level in a major corporation, there's nothing tangible there except what's up here. Uh, those of us, I think, that have played a role here will have left something tangible that hopefully will be here for generations to come. While the people of Pike County have made important strides in protecting their natural resources, it's an ongoing process. Education is a key element in ensuring that today's gains stand the test of time. Across the county, numerous individuals and groups are reaching out to people especially former city dwellers, to teach them about the natural wonders of the area 
and instill a sense of stewardship that can be passed from generation to generation. People who don't typically spend time outdoors in forests or hiking through a pine barren might miss a lot of what is so special about places like Pike County. Naturalist and environmental educator John Sorreo helps urbanites connect with the great outdoors. Go to a pine barrens, then you can go to a bog, then you can go to a glacial lake, you can go to all those habitats within 15 miles. The low elevations have the river valley, the Delaware River, the, one of the last wild and scenic rivers in the eastern United States, free-flowing rivers, and that beautiful floodplain forest that's along the shores of the Delaware where these big sycamores and silver maples grow. You just go a little bit up the banks from the Delaware and you went to a, a hemlock ravine where a waterfall comes down. So within a 15 mi- less than 15 miles really, you can go to six or seven completely different natural communities and see all the plants and animals that, that belong in those communities. And that's what makes this, a, this such a great place to live. But for John, spending time connecting with the environment is more than just a fun way to spend a weekend or a day while on vacation. It's an intrinsic part of who we are. One of the foremost ecologists in the world, Ed Wilson, says that we all are born with a certain propensity to nature, biophilia, he calls it. And um, without that nurturing uh, of that connection, we're going to lose it and not going to care at all about what happens throughout the, the world and, and, uh, and losing the natural areas and the, and the animals that depend on it. So I think it's very, very important that we do have certain wild areas and open spaces around us. Education and entertainment go hand in hand when you walk through the landscape with John. Underlying that is a serious effort to help people connect what they do and see here with their own lives. It's up to us, naturalists, environmental educators, to convince these people that it's to their own benefit to try to preserve what open space is left in our area, both for the health of the community and for the the very character of the area that they move to. I just have to take them out and and show them the wealth of uh, plants and animals that we still have here. See if I can find the spider that made this web. Yeah, here it comes. <laughs> and once I show them that, the message comes pretty easily after that, that would you want to lose this? Would you want to someday tell your child that there used to be frogs and toads in this place, but now it's been built on? Well, there used to be timber rattlesnakes up in that cliff, and they blasted it away and built the development up there. And I, and I think that that message is, is, the, is the most um, dramatic way to, to get this point across. John has encouraged that children are learning more than ever before about global environmental issues in schools. But when it comes to appreciating and learning to protect what's in their own backyard, there's still no substitute for walking in the woods and experiencing nature firsthand. When they're out on walks like this, they can learn more about what's in their own backyard. And that's the main thing I want to show these kids is that you don't have to go to a foreign country or the rainforest or or a wilderness area, really, to see nature. You can see it right in an area like this try to show the kids what is still left in this area and what is worthwhile about this that we need to protect. For John Barclay and his students, the ideal way to see and explore the natural wonders in and around Pike County is through the lens of a camera. This is one of the most beautiful regions in the Northeast for me. I I was born and raised in the New England area and came down here to Pennsylvania and uh, have fallen in love with nature photography through the last 10 years. And for me, this is my sojourn in the spring, and then I also come here in the fall. As with landscape painters of the past, today's nature photographers play an important role in capturing the natural world and communicating it to those who don't spend time in the wild. Increased awareness and appreciation of nature may play an important role in future conservation efforts. I don't want to see new telephone wires being put up or, uh, you know, cell phone towers. That would be really disappointing to see those go up. And I do think that people who get involved in these groups, and I enjoy the groups of uh, photography workshops, just because they are all kind of focused on nature. And we do talk about those things, actually, in small groups. It would be nice not to have, and to be nice to be, protect some of this land uh, so that we re- have this retain, and so we can shoot this beauty or photograph this beauty. With his passion for nature and photography, teaching was a natural progression for John. It's a rewarding opportunity to introduce others to the joys of nature. There's nothing better than that moment when you're working with a student and they have what I love to call the aha moment. That they've never seen reflections like we see around this corner. They've driven by them and through their peripheral vision they probably noticed there was something there. But then when you have them just zoom in and see that and they go, wow, that's exciting to me. Not only am I diffusing the light, and before you take the picture I want to do something. 
I'm going to take it all away. Look at that. Look how harsh that is. Okay. Now, the first step is to bring that in to diffuse it and then say, let's put a little bit of nature's sun back in there. So you got to get it too. Where's your tripod, sir? I know, but I don't have it. It's illegal. You have to have a tripod. That's what gives me joy is helping them to have the tools so that they can capture the essence of what they're seeing and translate that to film or to pixels nowadays. The proximity of this region to major metropolitan areas and the rural beauty of the county can be moving to people who rarely venture outside their urban environment. The experience can be profound. We do have people from New York City here today with the group that I'm with. And um, oftentimes I'll find those groups specifically uh, perched on a rock near a waterfall that we might be and not even with gear in their hands because they're so mesmerized by the music of the, the water that they hear or the music of the birds and the deer prancing through the woods and they're as much interested in here being here for that and actually when I teach that's a lot of what I try to tie into is it's not about just making images that's important that's certainly why they pay to come but I want them to understand that they're in a place that's magical that's different than the noise of the cars of the city it's the noise of nature and once they can tune into that it really affects their photography Increasingly, the noise and bustle of city life invades the serenity of pristine natural environments and creates conflict with the slow pace of country living. In places like Pike County, Pennsylvania, and countless small communities across America, the ability of residents to foster harmony among these often discordant ways of life will have a profound impact on the future of their community and their quality of life. Residents here know that the pressures of living in the lengthening shadows of the New York metropolitan area will only continue to increase. This once very rural area's uncertain future demands that difficult decisions be made. If the character of the community is to be preserved, new partnerships between activists and industry must be formed. Pike County's natural treasures, legacy of conservation and history of community engagement all bode well for Pike County's ability to successfully meet these challenges. Ultimately, however, the path this community takes will depend upon the ability of the stakeholders, whether they be residents, conservationists, or developers, to shape and share a vision for the place that they love. I think people themselves are aware, once it's gone, it's gone. You don't get it back. You've, you've taken it away, and when you've taken the habitat away, the animals have disappeared. Now it's gone, we're not bringing it back. Constructive human beings who are trying to solve a very difficult problem. Then you have the seeds for coming up with real solutions. There will be no simple solutions. There's no cookbook, there's no right answers. There's just that process of starting to trust. The and it's just been the beginning of an effort. It's not like we, we accomplished something and that's that and we can all go back to our, our homes and, and lead our lives. It's not, this is, it's, it's a way of life protecting this county. The Hotel Faucher, in the heart of Milford, Pennsylvania since 1852. Casually elegant accommodations and fine dining. For over 40 years, Davis R. Chand Realtors has been matching people with the right home in Wayne and Pike counties. We are proud to support nature's keepers in the efforts to conserve our area's natural beauty and heritage for future generations.
For over 40 years, Davis R. Chand Realtors has been matching people with the right home in Wayne and Pike counties. We are proud to support nature's keepers and the efforts to conserve our area's natural beauty and heritage for future generations. The Hotel Faucher, in the heart of Milford, Pennsylvania since 1852. Casually elegant accommodations and fine dining.